The theme for our uh, sermon this morning is um, very simple, and um, it is explained fully in the passage. It is, he fills to the brim when our trust is in him. He fills to the brim when our trust is in him. Let's have a little prayer before we come into the message. Our loving Father, we thank you for the expectation and anticipation of our heart today. As we gather for these precious moments around your open word, we thank you for its revelation. We thank you for its instruction. We thank you for its comfort, its challenge, even its reproof. We thank you that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And we would ask that here today we will catch every whisper as you minister your word to us. Build us up in our faith. Strengthen us so that we may be able to help others who are struggling in their faith and that we might be an example of godliness and righteousness and Christ-likeness to those who observe our walk with God. Hear our prayer, minister to us, and in the meditation of our heart, exalt the name of the Lord Jesus, through whom we pray. Amen. We've already noted that in the comparison between the life and the witness and the ministry of the prophet Elijah, and of the prophet Elisha, who was, in a sense and to a degree, trained or mentored by him, and therefore mirrors in some areas and to some extent the ministry that the fiery prophet Elijah had, that there are similarities, not so much with each other, but with others that we see performing uh, miracles or preaching powerfully as an instrument of righteousness right throughout both the Old and the New Testament. We've already noted that in a sense, Elijah represents the law and Elisha represents grace. You find also that Elijah is in a sense a, a forerunner of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist comes, we see him preaching about taking an axe to the root of the trees. We hear him speak of winnowing uh, and separating the chaff from the wheat. And we even hear him referring to a baptism of fire. Now, that was the kind of ministry that the prophet Elijah had. But when it comes to the prophet Elisha, we see not so much a toned down, but rather a more positively quiet and serene kind of ministry that in essence would be likened onto the ministry of Jesus. Now we know that Jesus at times raised his uh, righteous anger against those who blasphemed the temple and dishonored the name of God, taking a whip and casting out the money changers, for example. But you find that all through the ministry of Jesus, there is one compelling phrase or term that suggests the manner in which Christ presented the gospel to the people. When he saw the multitudes, 
he was moved with compassion. He had a ministry that went beyond the temple, the synagogue, and even beyond the crowds. And Jesus would sit down with one person and deal specifically with their need. That is what brings to us the hope and the truth of the gospel. God doesn't only draw near to us when we sit in church on Sunday morning. But when we're on our own in the quietness of our own thoughts and our heart turns toward him, he is always there, seated by the well, watching the progression of a funeral towards its bitter end where a mother follows the coffin of her only son. He is there. Remember Hagar in the Old Testament declared as she sat under a shady bush or shrub to watch her son die. She exclaimed, Thou, God, seest me. And so into this passage there is injected this personal application. It was not us of whom this passage speaks, but it could have been us. It may have been us, and possibly in another location, another time, another moment, another circumstance, this becomes our need. Now, can we draw hope from the Scriptures? Can we be confident that God will hear our prayer? that God will see our need, that he will intervene in the precise moments of our despair with the ingredient that will raise us from our despondency and plant our feet on the foundation of assurance and confidence and peace that passes all understanding. Elisha the prophet, had made a difference in the battle that has been raised in the preceding chapter, which we've just dealt with over the past few studies. He has been involved directly, even though he has not been present upon the battlefield. But he has prescribed the remedy. He has declared the word of God. He has given the instructions and the miracle has been performed. Now one would expect, would one not, immediate promotion for the prophet. Could it not be surmised that at last the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of even of Moab, and of course Uh, Esau, that all of these kings would somehow recognize that it was the power that was spoken of and introduced to them through the prophet Elisha, that the miracle of their deliverance and their defeat of their enemy has come about. Surely there ought to be some kind of recognition. We discover, however, that while he leaves the scene of this international conflict and the place um, of that experience, there is no such award, no such recognition, no such praise heaped upon the prophet. And very often that happens, and even to you and I in our field of ministry, We sense that somehow someone should acknowledge what we have done. Somehow someone should say that we appreciate it. And yet the word is unspoken. The feeling is not given. And very soon we could, if we allowed ourselves, begin to feel somewhat dejected. But as we discover reading through Scripture, we serve 
not to receive the plaudits of men. We serve not to feel that somehow we have made a contribution, but we serve because our service is to the one who has saved us and called us and planted our feet in that position, in that place, in that environment. And we serve unto him, and we know that a day is coming when we shall receive our reward. We don't lay up treasure here upon the earth. We lay up treasure in heaven. And therefore we don't look for the praise of men. We look for the peace of God. Here now is the prophet Elisha. And he makes his way immediately to the place and the position of his calling, to the school of the prophets. Better to be near the school of the prophets in the center of God's will than to be near the throne of Israel and be out of the center of the will of God. Now as we now begin to view uh, at a, a, a more detail what is developing in these first seven verses of Second Kings chapter 4, we will note that there are four simple yet distinct thoughts that emerge in the passage. And I want to just take you through those very briefly this morning. Verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 4, we see the disturbance of death. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. Now this, of course, immediately brings us to the realization that death is not a possibility for any of us. Death is a reality. No one can escape. Hebrews 9, verse 27 confirms that. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So all of us, when we are reminded of this reality, do well, be it old or young, to take stock and to be reminded that in view of this reality, we do well to make proper preparation. We need to be reminded that we do not know how many days God will give us on this earth. Therefore, we must make our peace with God at the earliest, not at the latest. But you notice what builds now around this uh, passage. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter refers to the woman as being the weaker vessel. Now, let's now look up the text. Let that sink in for a moment and um, overcome your fear and feelings of anger towards the preacher for having brought that thought up. But let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. I'll just take you back into verse 6 for a quick little moment and observe the context of the verse. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now some of the husbands out there might want to be thought of and looked at, and um, even served as Lord. But that's not what the passage means. And if you wives have any difficulty with your husband, 
misunderstanding that text. You just come and tell me, and I'll have a quiet word with him. We then come into verse 7, and here is what we're told. So the word Abraham is now changed, and it becomes husbands. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Now, that relates to the previous verse. You have to understand the relationship between Abraham and Sarah. And then you must apply that relationship into your relationship with your wives. Now, I'm not developing this theme. Time wouldn't permit this morning. But let's read the next little bit. Giving honor to the wife. That's a different approach, isn't it? That's not calling him Lord. That's not being obedient in all things, just doing what he says because he says it should be done. That's a whole different ball game in that sense. Dwelling with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. So the man may have the authority, but he doesn't abuse it. He uses it to promote his wife. And there'll be more on that subject, no doubt, as we go through the scriptures. But look at the next little part. In what way, how does he approach this? As to the weaker vessel. Now the word there could mean fragile. And there is a sense in which the way God has wired us and made us, there is a certain way in which the ladies are a little more fragile than the men. The men can have a stiff upper lip and force their way through the problems, but the wife will always worry. And she will worry most about her husband, even though at times he doesn't deserve it. But the word goes beyond that. It doesn't just mean fragile. It also means delicate. And it means exquisite. What does that really mean? Well, you just think for a moment about having a cup of tea or coffee. And the men will go for the old crockery, the old mug, the big, heavy, solid mug. That's a man's mug. But the ladies often will prefer the delicate china mug. Now both of them hold coffee, both of them serve the same purpose, but one is more robust and the other more delicate than the other. So how do you wash the crockery? And how do you wash the fine china? You have to do it differently. And that's the thought that is being brought in here. The wife or the woman, Peter tells us, is more delicate. We need to handle our wives with delicacy. But there's a little bit more involved in this. We come back to Second Kings chapter 4. And the verse begins, a certain woman. So there is the weaker vessel. Of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. So now the woman has become a widow. Can I ask, When is a woman at her most vulnerable, her most delicate? It is when she becomes 
a widow. Have you ever noticed how the Bible presents the position of the widow? Right back in the early Old Testament, there are principles established. We come into the New Testament and the principles are expanded. The church ought to look after the widows because there is a certain degree of vulnerability that is not found even in the weaker vessel, but in the fact that the woman has become a widow. Come with me to Lamentations chapter 1. Lamentations chapter 1. And in Lamentations chapter 1, you will see that as the prophet is, uh, is about to open up, as it were, the misery of Israel under the, uh, under the, the wrath of God, the judgment of God because of their sin and, and so on, he paints a picture of the total desolation of the nation. And what is the picture that he can present? What is it that he can give in order to elaborate, to underline, to expose the vulnerability of the nation exposed to the wrath of God? Here it is, Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. He gives the picture of the widow sitting, as it were, solitary. Now come over into James chapter 1, now that you've found Lamentations. James chapter 1. Over through the book of Hebrews into James. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefined religion before God and the Father is this. You have to learn the Ten Commandments. You have to study the Westminster Confession of Faith. You have to exercise due diligence in the disciplines of the church constitution. No. Here it is, pure and simple. Look at verse 27. Pure and undefined religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's true and pure religion. You see, if I love God, I will love others. If I serve God, I will serve others. And how does God minister to the widows? He ministers through the church, through his body. And we need to be developing that kind of ministry and that kind of love, uh, one for another, and particularly for those within our fellowship who are in this position. Uh, more of that will come through as we continue in this book of Second Kings. But let us come back to verse 1 of Second Kings 4. The last part of the verse, you will notice, reveals the true condition and position of the woman. Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Well, that's very appropriate. That's very important because he is in the school of the prophets. 
He's a preacher. He is a student of theology. A sad and sorry day if there is ever a preacher who preaches without the fear of God in his heart. But here she now is. The creditor is coming, so she's in debt. To take my two sons to be his slaves. So this is her plight. Her husband has died. He has left her a heavy debt. More of that in a moment. And all she has are two sons. But now the creditor is entitled to demand that her two sons, instead of serving her, must serve him. So her plight is worsening all the time. Here is not only uh, in the first thought the disturbance of death, but here comes the dilemma of death. Her husband has left her in a position where without state or welfare payments, she must live on the goodwill of those around her, either by donation or perhaps self-motivated provision, like growing your own vegetables and trying to accommodate the need in that particular way. But the pressure is on. The creditor is knocking on the door. It may not be long until two large, tattooed men, looking like bikies, will stand on the door and demand either the money, cash in hand, all your two sons will be forced into servitude. Now, you put yourself in that position today. If you go back into Exodus 21, and you'll find this in your notes, or Leviticus 25, or Deuteronomy 15, the creditor was entitled to demand that uh, the children of the one who had created the debt could be taken into servitude. Not slavery, but into servitude. So in other words, instead of receiving a wage for the work that they did, that wage would go into paying off the debt. And there would come a time when the debt would or could be fully paid. But this is the position that she'd reached. She's literally driven to despair. Now, Come back into 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, and look at verse 4. 1 Kings 18. Here we read of the intention and the actual persecution of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. We've read all about them. We've studied them in, in the past. Now here was their intention. For so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. It was the intention of the wicked kings of Israel that they would cut off the voice of the prophets that were exposing their sin and calling down the judgment of God upon the nation. They were determined that they were going to create the atmosphere where the prophets of God and those in the school of the prophets came under direct opposition and therefore persecution. They wanted to rid the land of every godly influence and those who represented the word of God had become targets. So the full force of the law was on the side of the creditor and the debtor had to face 
the music. Now, has this not always been right throughout the course of history? Let's take just a moment to reflect upon what led to the Reformation. We could go back into the early New Testament where it all began with the appointment of the bishop, of the elder, of the deacon. Three positions that were distinct in their application, but they became blurred until two positions were created. The elder and the bishop became one and the same. And then there were the deacons. Very soon it was created that one bishop became the chief bishop and therefore became the sovereign over all of the churches. Now, without going into all the detail offered by the Middle Ages, virtually all of Europe had descended into what became known as Roman paganism. That meant that relics, icons, unscriptural rituals and practices began to feature in worship. And the church established in England, which became the Church of England, was built upon the false doctrines of transubstantiation. That means that the priest, through prayer, turns the bread into the actual body of Jesus, turns the wine into the actual blood of Jesus. And as the priest administers that to the congregation through the Mass or through communion, that as you partake, you take into yourself literally the body and the blood of Christ. That is the doctrine of transubstantiation taught in uh, the Roman Catholic Church and in the Orthodox churches. There was the adoration of Mary. If you read a, a Catholic Bible, you will discover that there are insertions that are not found in the Protestant Bibles that set Mary up as a co-redeemer with Jesus. You cannot approach Christ alone. You must go through his mother, Mary. So Mary is then described as being holy, without sin, hence the Immaculate Conception, and all of these strange doctors, uh, doctrines. I was thinking of a minister back at home, well known if I mentioned his name, who used to always say, if I take sick, I don't want to go and see the doctor's mother. I need to go and see the doctor. And that's how it is. We go straight to Jesus. He answers our need. We have praying to the saints. And all of these rituals built into the church that had their origins in pagan Babylonian worship. You'd find all of them listed in the Old Testament, carried through from the pagan practices of nations around uh, the children of Israel. The true word of God was suppressed, but God kept the light burning. If I mentioned names, you'd identify with them. John Wycliffe, who published tracts and uh, translated the Bible into modern language so that the common person could read the Bible uh, for themselves. William Tyndale, who followed him, who continued with that process. Martin Luther, the monk, who one day on his knees uh, trying to do penance to earn his salvation as he climbed up the steps of the cathedral, suddenly realized the just shall live by faith. We're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. He then began to write a series of doctrinal statements denying and denouncing the teaching of the day, where indulgences were being sold as a means of raising money for the church under the premise that if you purchased one of these indulgences, immediately your soul would be marked, go straight 
to heaven. You would not have to go to purgatory. You would not have to go through the fires of hell. And so the church was getting richer and richer, but the gospel was suffering more and more. And so Martin Luther, in the year 1517, having written down a list of these denunciations of this teaching, nailed his protest to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg in Germany. Then we have John Calvin, published his treaty in Geneva in 1539. He sets out very clearly doctrine as it's found in the scripture, a bold statement of theology which became the theology of the Reformation. You can buy that today under the title Institutes of the Christian Religion. You find that because of these two key men, there were others, there was Zwingli in Switzerland, there was John Knox in Scotland, and so on. But under these two men, uh, the Church of England was formed. And you find that right to this uh, day, the Church of England is Lutheran in its liturgy and is Calvinistic in its theology. So that's where the mix comes through Luther and Calvin. Now, cutting to the chase, Queen Elizabeth I came to the throne of England on the 15th of January, 1559, following the death of her sister Mary the previous year. Mary had been a very devout Catholic, as was her father. But when Queen Elizabeth came to the throne, she was a political Protestant which meant that she was not a Protestant by conviction. It was uh, politically suitable for her to, to be so. And, and so she began to introduce uh, things that uh, made it slightly less pressured for those who were opposing the teaching of the Catholic Church. But under the process of her reign, a number of things happened, and they had to do with Parliament. She insisted that changes be made and be written in law to give a certain freedom, but yet hold tightly to the reins of all the teaching and preaching that was carried out in the churches all across England and of course, across Europe, where the influence could be taken. And in 1559, and you're not going to remember any of these dates, I know, but in 1559, two things happened that became vitally important in what becomes the, the process leading up to the Reformation. There were two Acts of Parliament that were adopted or passed. One became known as the Act of Supremacy. And breaking that down very simply, it just means that uh, the ruling of Parliament and now established in law was that the reigning monarch, in this case Queen Elizabeth I, the ruling monarch must be seen and recognized to be the head of the church. Now, what does that mean in, in real terms? It simply means that the church cannot accept or believe or act upon the fact that Christ is the head of the church. Christ is no longer the head of the church. Royalty, the queen or the king, is the head of the church. Who's the head of the Church of England today? The monarch, recognized as being the head of the church. 
But that wasn't the only act. There was another one. And following the act of supremacy came the act of uniformity. Now that simply means they wanted everyone who went to church to get the same medicine. They developed this uh, thought that only what was sanctioned by the queen could be taught in the church. And in order to do that, then everyone had to be brought to the church. They resurrected the old prayer book that had been brought out by King Edward VI, uh, which was full of uh, old Roman uh, teachings that were not conducive to the scripture or to the gospel. And uh, the prayer book then became the official means for worship. Three things were included in the act of uniformity. Orderly worship, that is, only by use of the prayer book. Proper location could only be in the parish church. And third, there had to be full attendance. If you didn't attend church on Sunday, you were fined 12 pence. So the deacons would be knocking on your door, 6 o'clock, Monday morning, looking for the 12 pence if you didn't turn up in church. That's a good incentive to attend church, isn't it? Well, these were all built in to, to this act of uniformity. And a little bit more about that in a moment. Just very quickly, let's take another little glance into what's now developing. Not everyone is happy with this. Particularly those who know that Christ is the head of the church, not the queen. Those who know that we have a right to worship God wherever we are. We don't have to go to the parish church. And if we go to the parish church, all we're going to get is the prayer book. And it's full of blasphemous comments and popish theology. So why should we go to church if we're being taught you have to worship Mary? And if you receive communion, you're receiving grace, and therefore you're a Christian. So you, the more you take of the bread and the wine, the better Christian you're going to be. Uh, why should we go to church and sit under that teaching and listen to the minister reading prayers from the prayer book? And so a group of people began to resist. And very shortly they were given a name, and it wasn't meant to be a name to be proud of. And the name was Puritan. And the Puritans were a group who simply refused to obey the ruling of the Parliament and of the Queen. They decided that it was best for them to meet separately, even though if caught there could be a fine or there could be imprisonment. But little by little these groups were growing and then they elected some of their members to Parliament. And there was a move in Parliament where they brought a motion to Parliament in the way and in the form of an act. And the act was to try and have all of the other acts reversed, but of course it didn't work. In fact, it created a greater division. And so the Queen, having had this act known as an admonition to Parliament, defeated, begins to put the pressure on even more and introduces two acts one in, in 1664 and one in 1670, known as the Conventical Acts, were designed to make it even more difficult for those who opposed what was the teaching of the church. A. Punishable with fine and imprisonment all persons over 16 years other than members 
of the same family who meet together for any religious worship save that of the Book of Common Prayer. In other words, if you don't do what we tell you, it will be punishable with fine or imprisonment for anyone over the age of 16. B. Goods and chattels may be sold to pay the fine and one-third of the fine to go to the informant. Isn't that a good incentive for your neighbor to dob you in? If you're having a secret meeting in your home, and you've invited a few friends around, and uh, you have uh, made it known that you're just having a little celebration, a, a birthday or, or something in the home, but actually you're going to have a meeting. So the neighbor informs on you. <clears throat> in come the authorities. They put you out of your home. They sell your home. And everything that's in it, and your neighbor gets one-third of the value of it. Houses may be broken into for the purpose of breaking up any such conventicle. And D, magistrates and any other officers who do not apply the law may themselves be fined. See how they were tightening the screws. Then they brought in in 1665 the Five Mile Act, and this is the last and here it is. It's unlawful for anyone who had been a parson, a vicar, a curate, or who had been in holy orders and who did not subscribe to everything in the prayer book. That's the act of uniformity. To approach within five miles of any city, town, or borough, or within five miles of any parish in which he had ministered. B. All who broke the law were liable to a fine of 40 pounds. This was to cut off all support and to starve the dissidents and the dissenters into submission. These were the happenings that were leading into and flowing through the days of Reformation, 502 years ago. But what happened at the Reformation? Well, we know what happened. We're here today. We enjoy this freedom of worship. We don't have to use the prayer book. I mean, we could. If you really wanted to, we could use the prayer book. But you'd have to find another minister. <laughs> we don't have to use the prayer book. We pray from the heart. As God ministers to us, our heart is overflowing with love for him, and we desire to speak with him and to pray to him. And any one of us can do that. It's not just limited to the minister. We can all pray to God openly and in freedom. God brought his people and his word safely through. Now let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 4. Look at verses 2 to 4. <clears throat> Elisha said, well, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. What do you have? Reformers, what do you have? We don't have anything to fight against this. Only God. This widow woman, what do you have? She replied, nothing. I've got nothing but a jar of oil. Now we all know the saying, don't we? Little is much, let's say it, if God is in it. Little is much if 
God is in it. See, the question is not, what can I do with nothing? The question is, what can God do with a pot of oil? That's the question. What can God do with a little pebble from a brook? Well, you ask David. What can a little lad do with his lunch? You ask the little lad. You see, we don't have to have anything as long as we have God. If God is for us, then who can be against us? And in every walk of life, in every stage, in every experience, if we are in the will of God, then we have everything we need because he has promised that he will take care of us. Now look at the faith of Elisha in verses 3 and 4 of Second Kings chapter 4. Elisha said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather a few. Uh, and here is the thought. There must have been a failure in olives this particular year, for some reason. Because normally the neighbors would not have had empty vessels. So God said, through the prophet, Go and collect everything you can from all of your neighbors and bring them back here (coughs) to the house. And the second thing that he said is, in verse 4, When you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside, note, the full ones. In other words, you get as many vessels as you can and you make sure that you fill them, every one of them, up to the brim. See, there are no half measures with God. The last thought, the discipline of deliverance. According to your faith, be it unto you. Look what happens in verse 5. She poured it out. And look what happens in verse 6. Came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. See what's happening here. The oil didn't run out they simply ran out of empty vessels. If she had brought more, she would have filled more. According to your faith, be it unto you. Do you limit God? Do you suppose that God is not able to do for you all that you need? If we are prepared to trust in him, he will fill what every vessel we bring right up to the brim. One little text, and with this we close. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. The last book of the Old Testament. The book of Malachi chapter 3. And verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, the author says, prove me now. It simply means put me to the test. It's a little bit Like in Isaiah chapter 1, where where the prophet summons Israel, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's look at this realistically. Here God is saying, 
I've made the promise. Now you need to put that promise to the test. And, and here is how it works. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing. Now take a little close look at the last part of the verse. Have you noticed how many of the words are in italics? Have you noticed that? They're in italics. What does that mean? It means that the translators had a little bit of a struggle finding the appropriate or the right words. And because they're not fully convinced or sure, they put the words in italics so that you know that there could be more to this than they have translated. Let me just share with you what the more is. Look at that last part of the verse. That there will not be room enough to receive it. Here is a simple and literal translation. And pour out for you such a blessing that there shall be no more need. Not room enough to receive it. What does that mean? It means there'll be no more need. Whatever your need is, he will meet it. Whatever grace you require, he will supply it. It doesn't matter what your need is, how dire your position is. If you trust in God, he has promised and he will answer and fulfill the promise. He will meet your need. All the vessels were filled to overflowing. And here is the last little thought. Look at verse 7. Go, sell the oil, pay your debt, and then get off to work and look after yourselves as best you can for the rest of your lives. Is that how it ends? No. Look at the verse again. Go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. See, that's blessing, shaken down, pressed down, shaken together and running over. That's how God delivers his mercy to us. The Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean? I shall not want. Do you trust him? Do you trust him fully? Are you borrowing vessels from your neighbors so that you can fill up the blessing of God in your heart? That's the God that we worship. That's the God we serve. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your word afresh today. And we know that sometimes we are reluctant to trust you. We like to feel that somehow we are able to contribute to the recovery of our lives. And yet so often we struggle and we fear and our faith becomes weak and we feel as though we have lost something of the joy of our salvation. But we know in our heart, because we read your word and we know your word, we know that this should not be. We know that you challenge us and you call us to trust in you. And you've promised to direct us, <clears throat> to walk with us, to bless us, to encourage us. But so often we hide ourselves away from the light of the sun and we sit in the darkened cave feeling sorry for ourselves when we know we ought to at least 
go to the door and look out and see the sun is shining and then be encouraged to walk into the light even as you were in the light enjoying that fellowship one with another. So help us, Lord, to rise above our unbelief, to live in the realm of believing prayer so that we too will be able to witness to your grace and for your glory. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.